Welcome to this introductory statistics course. My name is Dr. Kaspar van Lissa and I'm an associate professor of social data science at Tilburg University, the Netherlands. What many people don't realize is that statistics is an ongoing field of research and myself and many colleagues are discovering and developing new methods of analyzing data. And at the same time, statistics is a very practical tool that you can use to find answers to your research questions. And with this in mind, today we are going to be covering the very basics of this field of research. Let's get into it. If you were born in the late 90s or early 2000s, there is data on every aspect of your life from the moment you were born until the moment you are taking this course. And the importance of data in our daily life and in decisions being made by researchers, by practitioners, companies and governments are increasingly driven by data. When teaching this course in person, at this point I typically show my Google timeline which documents exactly how I get to work every morning from Amsterdam to Tilburg. And it's not merely the fact that every aspect of your life is documented, it's the fact that stakeholders are really hungry to get access to those data. Here are two newspaper clippings, both almost a decade old at the time of recording, that detail the discussions being had in governments around the world about governments' right to access their citizens' data. But as a student, you may be wondering, what can you do with data? Well, I would be so bold as to say that the future belongs to those who are data literate, who are able to extract insight from data and use it to improve their decision making. Specifically in this course, we will discuss how you can use data to better understand social life, predict sales and optimize marketing, and explore what activity in the brain is associated with observed behavior. And for each of these three topics, we also have sample data available that you can experiment around and conduct analyses with. To sum it up, I would say that data analysis is one of the most marketable skills that you will learn during your time at university. Before we delve deeper into statistics, I think it's helpful to demarcate the distinction between methods and statistics. On the one hand, the field of methods is about the procedures of research. What actions can we take to collect high quality data? Which participants should we seek to include in our samples? How do we measure what we want to measure? and how can we design studies that are suitable for answering our research questions. Statistics, on the other hand, is all about analyzing data. And there are different subfields of statistics. For example, descriptive statistics are about describing the characteristics of a limited sample of participants. Inferential statistics is about how you can draw conclusions about an unobserved population based on a limited observed sample. Statistical modeling is all about the relationship between theory and mathematical representations of that theory, and how can you represent a theory as a statistical model. But statistics also deals with predicting important outcomes so that you know, for example, how many resources to purchase or what your projected sales figures are. Statistics is also about exploring data to find interesting patterns, for example, to figure out what kind of people are most drawn to particular majors in school. And statistics are all about performing tests to answer theory-driven research questions. Now that we're laying the foundation for your understanding of statistics, I think it would be helpful to start with a dictionary of our definitions of basic concepts. First of all, when we talk about data in this course, we are exclusively talking about what's called tabular data. And tabular data lives inside a spreadsheet. Here's an example of a spreadsheet on the screen, but spreadsheets can also be text files or Excel files. The most important characteristic of tabular data is that every row represents one individual, and we use the subscript I to refer to any individual, and columns contain characteristics of that data, and we call those variables. So a variable is any characteristic that can differ between individuals. If a characteristic doesn't differ between individuals, for example, your participants are all enrolled at Tilburg University and you have a column that's labeled university and the only value it has is Tilburg, that's not a variable, that's a constant. So a constant is like the opposite of a variable. So let's imagine that we have this tabular data set that represents some individuals and their characteristics. Where do these individuals come from? Well, they are drawn from a hypothetical population. And the population is the entire exhaustive collection of potential participants. So they have to be defined by some characteristics. For example, you could say 
my population is all people living in the Netherlands, and then draw a sample, for example, by picking names out of a phone book of the Netherlands. Or you could say, my participants are all of the students in this class, and then draw a sample from that population by just randomly pointing fingers or asking the first row of the classroom to participate. And a population has a certain size. So for example, when we talk about the population of the Netherlands, that's about 17 and a half million people. Or if we talk about students in a class, that may be about 75 students. And that is the size of the entire population. But typically when we do research, we don't have access to the whole population. What we do instead is draw a sample from it, a collection of participants of a fixed size and the size of that sample we call lowercase n. So uppercase n is the size of the population, and that number may be unknown. Lowercase n is the size of our sample, and that we definitely know. As I explained when I showed the tabular data, we typically want to measure different characteristics of our participants. And with this in mind, it's useful to know what a construct is. So a construct is an abstract feature that we intend to measure. For example, short-term memory is a construct in neuroscience. Intelligence is a construct in psychology. Perseverance is another psychological construct. Education may be a sociological construct. Oftentimes, we have to be a little bit more concrete when we want to measure an abstract construct. And that's where the operational definition comes in. So an operational definition is a concrete way to measure an abstract construct. For example, you could measure short-term memory by having participants do a word recall task. Or you could measure intelligence using the validated Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. Or you could measure education by asking people what's the highest degree that you've received. Once we've defined our operational definition for each construct, we can measure people's values. And we record those values in what we call a variable. So a variable is a mathematical placeholder for specific values. For example, we could say that WACE is a variable representing individual scores on the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. And you can refer to a variable without yet knowing its specific values. So I could say, for a sample of 75 students, I measured their scores on the WACE. And then the variable WACE represents that unknown collection of values. But we also have data and data are the specific values that we have collected. So an example of data would be, I have a participant called Jen, and Jen scored 138 on the WACE variable. So what's the role of these data in scientific research? Well, it's good to take a quick moment to acknowledge philosophy of science. Dutch methodologist Adrian de Groot introduced a concept called the empirical cycle. And the empirical cycle is kind of a stylized representation of the process of knowledge acquisition through scientific research. So de Groot describes how research begins with a theory that is an abstract representation of how you think things work in the world. From that theory, you deduce specific hypotheses. And these hypotheses are testable propositions. Next, you collect a sample of data and you use those data to put the hypothesis to the test. So your data may be either congruent with the hypothesis or incongruent with it. Based on that result, you may reflect a little further. You may think, well, if this hypothesis was not true in my sample, maybe the theory was wrong. So maybe I have to amend my theory. Or you might say, hey, I've observed some interesting patterns in my data. I'm going to induce a more general rule based on the patterns that I've observed and generalize that by amending my theory. And ideally, this way we have ever improving theoretical models in our field of research. Of course, in real life, research practice is messier than this. But it's important for the context of this course to know that we are mostly focusing on the right half of this empirical cycle. So most of the time we'll start with a theory, we'll deduce a hypothesis from that theory, and then we'll test that hypothesis in some data, interpret the results and report them. So let's make that procedure a little more concrete. We can connect the empirical cycle to the aforementioned distinction between constructs and variables. So for example, your theory may imply 
a relationship between construct A and construct B. And if you want to make that testable, you have to translate that to the empirical level and say, well, if the theory implies a relationship between construct A and construct B, then on an empirical level, we will see an association between variable A and variable B. So here's a practical example based on a recent study that I was involved in. The theory dictates that being exposed to war increases depression. And we can make this testable by investigating whether in a sample of servicemen and women uh, being deployed to an active war zone or not positively predicts scores on a depression inventory. The relationship between population and sample is described in what is called sampling theory. So sampling theory describes the existence of this abstract population. And a population has certain characteristics, for example, variable x. And if we could access everybody in a population score on variable x, then we could perform some kind of descriptive analysis. And we could say, well, this population has an average score of this much and their scores are about this spread out, or this proportion of the population has a certain trait or doesn't have a certain trait. And we call these descriptive characteristics of the population parameters. So if you would have access to the whole population, you could measure their characteristics and those would be their parameters. And to indicate that we're talking about parameters, we typically use Greek letters. The problem is, of course, that we typically don't have access to the whole population unless we work at the Census Bureau. So what we do as researchers is we draw a sample from the population. Within this sample too, we could measure variable x and we could calculate sample descriptive statistics. The sample also has an average score. There is measures of dispersion, how spread out people's values are within the sample. There's proportions of the occurrence of certain traits and we indicate these sample statistics with Roman letters. Now I mentioned before that one branch of statistics is called inferential statistics. And inferential statistics deals with how we can make best guesses about population parameters based on sample statistics. Sample statistics are also our best guess about the value of population parameters. Of course, this guess will never be perfect. In other words, sample statistics are never exactly equal to the population parameter. But in this course, you will learn ways to express your uncertainty. How inaccurate is your sample statistic as an estimator of the population parameter? One key quality of samples is whether or not they are representative. The more representative your sample is of the population, the better your guesses about population parameters will be. And the very best way to ensure that you get a representative sample is to use random sampling when you draw your participants from the population. And a random sample simply means that every individual in the population has an equal probability of being included. In practice, however, this is also rarely possible. So we often deal with non-random samples where the probability of an individual being included is not known to the researcher. Examples of this include convenience sampling. Remember when I talked about just asking the first row of students to participate? That's a convenience sample. And in convenience sampling, you often see that the proportion of being included is related to how accessible to the researcher those participants are. The first row is nice and close to me. Another convenient sample is when researchers ask college students to participate. Their probability is also increased because they are close to the researcher. They are enrolled in the same school where the researcher works. Another type of non-random sampling is a snowball sample, where you first draw a sample and you ask every participant to invite some of their friends and acquaintances. Another non-random sample is a cluster sample. For example, I did a lot of research with this large sample of adolescents who were recruited by randomly sampling schools in the Netherlands and then asking all students in those schools to participate in the study. So those students are clustered within the schools, right? The schools were randomly selected, but the students were not. Anytime you use a non-random sample, you introduce some kind of sampling bias. That means that your estimates 
of population parameters will be systematically off in one way or another, and you typically don't know in, what, in which direction. Another term that we have to define is the measurement level of variables. A measurement level relates to what type of information this variable carries. A convenient acronym to remember the four measurement levels is NOIR, the French word for black. And when I introduce these four measurement levels to you, what I want you to notice is that each level carries more information than all the levels before it. So the N stands for nominal. And nominal is a categorical variable. That means you're encoding group membership. And these groups differ only in name. So for example, are people from the Netherlands or from abroad? Do people have a tattoo or not? Do people identify as male or female? or maybe other. The O is the second measurement level and it stands for ordinal. Ordinal is still a categorical variable, so we're still talking about groups, but these groups have a natural rank order. For example, low, medium and high SES are ordered. The I is the third measurement level and it stands for interval. Now this is the first measurement level that represents numeric values, so it could take on theoretically any numerical value. One, 10, 4.8, it doesn't matter. The important characteristic is that the distance between one and two and between 102 and 103 must be equal. In other words, intervals on this variable must have a meaningful and consistent interpretation. The fourth and final measurement level is ratio. Now ratio variables are also numeric, but they also have a meaningful zero point. And any variable that has a meaningful zero point allows for the calculation of ratios with a meaningful and consistent interpretation. Here's an interesting example. If you think about temperature, there are different scales to represent scores on temperature. For example, Celsius, Fahrenheit and Kelvin. Now Celsius and Fahrenheit are interval scales. A distance between zero and one degrees is as big as the distance between four and five degrees but the zero point is arbitrary on these scales. Kelvin, on the other hand, is a ratio scale. It has an absolute zero point at which the atoms stop moving. You cannot get any colder than that. So you could use Kelvin to calculate meaningful temperature ratios, but you cannot do that with Celsius or Fahrenheit. To illustrate this problem, look at these two thermometers. One indicates 20 degrees and the other indicates 40 degrees. Now visually, it looks as if the temperature in the right thermometer is twice as high as in the left thermometer. But the zero point is arbitrary. So here we've changed the zero level. And now it looks like the thermometer on the right has a three times as high temperature as the one on the left. In other words, the ratios are not meaningful if there's no consensus about the zero point. Why am I telling you about measurement level? Well, measurement level really matters because it determines what kind of calculations you can do with a variable. It relates to the kind of information that's encoded in that variable and you need certain types of information to perform certain kinds of calculations. It's important to take a moment and to realize that measurement level is not only a property of a construct, but also of its operational definition. And ideally, you would want these two to be the same, but that's not always possible. An interesting example is sex assigned at birth. Typically, birth certificates offer two categories, male or female, despite the fact that there is more variability in biological indicators of sex. So this would be a nominal variable. Gender identification, on the other hand, is more fluid. It relates to the cultural associations with what gender means to people. The noir taxonomy distinguishes four measurement levels, but you will see other distinctions out there that partially map onto the noir measurement levels. For example, we will often talk about categorical variables, and this is an umbrella term for the nominal and ordinal measurement level. You will also hear people talk about continuous variables, and this is an umbrella for the interval and ratio levels. You will also hear people talk about qualitative variables, that's typically synonymous with nominal measurement level. And you will hear people talking about quantitative variables, 
which encode a difference in degrees. So this could be ordinal or interval or ratio. And I want you to consider some interesting edge cases. For example, number of children. It's a ratio variable because four children is twice as many as two. But it's also in a way discrete because you can't have two and a half children. You always just have one or two or three or four, which seems a bit more similar to a nominal or ordinal variable. Or you could consider a scale of political orientation ranging from left to right or from conservative to liberal. Yes, this scale is ordinal, but which of these two is higher than the other? And the direction is arbitrary. Like I said, the measurement level of variables describes what kind of calculations you can perform on them. And that brings me to the topic of descriptive statistics. You use descriptive statistics to summarize variables across your entire sample. It is good practice to examine these for all of your variables to check for coding mistakes, but also to get an understanding of who your participants are. For example, you may want to know which major is the most common among liberal arts and sciences students. Or you may wonder, how old are my students on average? So I use examples that don't seem too dated. Or how much do the ages of my students vary? Are they all pretty much from the same cohort or is there a larger spread? What's the gender distribution of my students? Sometimes descriptive statistics can also be useful for answering research questions. For example, I may want to know as a teacher whether the proportion of correct answers on a specific multiple choice question is greater than chance. Because if it's not greater than chance, then perhaps I failed to teach you the topic that this question is assessing. Depending on the measurement level of your variable, you can use different statistics to describe it. For example, let's consider this nominal variable, the proportion of students within each of the three major tracks of liberal arts and sciences. Five students take the major business and economics, 25 take the major cognitive neuroscience, and 45 take the major social sciences. I could represent this as a frequency distribution, so that's just the number of people in each category, or I could represent this as a percentage distribution or probability distribution by dividing the frequency by the total number of students and then I get the column on the right. I can also visualize this very same table as a bar chart. So bar chart is a visual instrument where the different groups are on the x-axis and the number of people in those groups or the proportion of people in each group is displayed on the y-axis. And to visually signal that this is a nominal variable, the bars do not touch, so they're distinct from each other. You might also consider an ordinal variable. For example, we might ask students to indicate their family's socioeconomic status. This can be rank ordered from low to medium or high. So here again, you can calculate the frequency of students from each of the three categories. And we could calculate a percentage by dividing the frequency by the total number of students. But because this is an ordinal variable, it also makes sense to calculate a cumulative percentage where you add up subsequent categories. So 100% of all students have a socioeconomic status. You can see that by the fact that the cumulative percentage for the high category is one or 100%. And then you see that 91% of students have a low or medium socioeconomic status and 43% have a low socioeconomic status. We could still represent ordinal variables using a bar chart, but in this case, it's important that the categories are in the correct order on your x-axis. Now let's talk about continuous variables. For example, I could measure the height of all of the students in my classroom. Now height can take on any value, and what I could do is represent the distribution of heights in my classroom in a histogram, which is what we see here. So what I've done is I've simplified the data by grouping students together in what are called bins. So each bar here indicates a bin and the bars are touching because this variable is continuous. So I don't have to imply any kind of separation between the different bins. And then still we see that the height of the bar indicates the number of students with that particular height. So if you look at this histogram, you see that the peak is around 170 centimeters. And we see that extreme values like below 160 centimeters 
or above 185 are exceedingly rare. So we get this kind of shape where there's a peak in the distribution around the average value and the tails are kind of more spread out. So we can also calculate statistics to summarize the distributional properties of each variable. And what kind of statistics we can calculate depends again on the measurement level. So for example, if we want to know what's the most common response in the sample, the statistical way of telling people what's the most common response is to calculate measures of central tendency. And I'm going to introduce you to three of them. The first one is the mode, and the mode just means the most common value. So this makes sense to report for a nominal or an ordinal variable. For example, I could say the most common socioeconomic status in my classroom was medium. If we have a variable with at least an ordinal measurement level, however, then we can also calculate what's known as the median. And the median literally is the middle value in my sample. That means if I took everybody's scores on this variable and I ordered them from low to high, and I would pick the middle value, that's the median. It is also known as the 50th percentile. That means that 50% of people scored lower than this value and 50% of people scored higher than this value. Let's look at two examples. So here we have an ordinal variable and the scores are four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and nine. Remember that the median is the middle value. So if I order these values from low to high, I just see, well, there's an unequal number of observations. The middle value is seven. That means that the median is seven. In the second example, we have an equal number of observations and the values are four, five, six, eight, nine, nine. What's the middle value here? Well, actually we don't have a single one. We have two. The middle values are six and eight. And the median must be exactly between those. So here again, we would report a median of seven. So the take home message is, when computing the median, if you have an odd number of cases, just pick the case that has the middle value. And if you have an even number of cases, take the average between the two values that are in the middle. We can also look at the mode in both of these examples. The mode is the most frequently occurring score. And in both of these examples, that is nine. The final measure of central tendency is what's called the mean. And this is what you probably think about when I say the average value. So to get the mean, you just add up all of the values and divide by the number of values. And you can only do this with continuous variables. That is to say, interval or ratio measurement level. Why do we need all of these measures of central tendency? Well, here's an interesting opinion article by Professor Ionica Smeets. And she reports that on average, the Australian person is a millionaire, but most Australians are not. Although this sounds counterintuitive, those statements are consistent with one another because the average is calculated by just adding up all of the values and dividing by the number of participants. And if there are some people with extremely high incomes, that will really bring up the mean. But most Australians are not millionaires. And this is what we call a skewed distribution. In this case, it is a positive skew where very few people have extremely high scores of income. There's also symmetrical distributions, which are not skewed. And there are negatively skewed distributions where very few people have really low scores. The three different measures of central tendency respond differently to skew. As illustrated here, if the distribution is symmetrical, they are all the same. But if the distribution is very skewed, then the mode tells you what the most common value is. And the median is kind of an average value that is less affected by extremely high values. The mean, on the other hand, gets really excited about a few extreme values and is pulled over to the right. So in a positively skewed distribution, such as income, what you will see is that the mode best represents the most common value followed by the median, and the mean is not very representative of most people's scores. Aside from measures of central tendency, there are also measures of dispersion, and these indicate how spread out the different values in my sample are. So I already talked about the distinction between a variable, which means that people's scores differ, 
and a constant, which means that people's scores are all the same. So if you think about measures of dispersion, a constant would have zero dispersion, no differences. And a variable could have very low dispersion or it could have very high dispersion. And low dispersion means that most people have very similar scores and high dispersion means that people vary extremely in their scores. And again, which measure of dispersion I can use depends on the measurement level. For a nominal variable, pretty much the best I can do is just report a frequency table. And that shows me the count or the percentage of responses for each category. It's possible to summarize the dispersion in a frequency table, but that's not part of this course material. If we have variables with at least an ordinal measurement level, then we can additionally report the range. What's the lowest and the highest score that people reported? So this gives me the range between the minimum and the maximum value in my sample. Looking at the range is very useful if you want to see whether you made any transcription mistakes when entering the data into a spreadsheet. For example, if you use a seven point scale for a questionnaire, but you observe that the range goes up to 77, you probably hit the key twice there and you made a mistake. And the last measure of dispersion that I will introduce is the variance. We can calculate variances for continuous variables only. And it tells us the average squared distance of individual observations to the mean. So for every individual, they are a certain distance away from the mean. Some of those distances are negative. Some of those distances are positive. To make them all positive, I square them, add them up, and divide by the total number of observations. That gives me the variance. So variance means how spread out people's values are. And you might imagine, for example, that if you measure height in basketball teams, most people are very tall with very little differences between players because they are selected into basketball teams for being very tall. That would be a distribution with a small variance indicated by the blue distribution on screen. Note that I've removed information about the mean from this graphic. In the general population, however, height is much more spread out. So there you would expect a larger variance, which is represented by a more spread out distribution, which is the red distribution in this graph. Imagine this is the number line and this is the zero point, right? And we have four values. One value is minus four. That's this guy. One value is plus four. That's this guy. And then we have two values of one. These two guys. Okay, so here are the different measures of central tendency. The first one is the mode, and the mode is just the most common value in the data set. So this one only occurs one time, this one only occurs one time, this one occurs two times. So this is the mode. The mode is one. Mode is one. The median is the value for which it's true that 50% of the data are smaller than it and 50% of the data are larger than it. So here we have four data points. So this is also going to be the median. So if the median is one, then we can say, well, this value and this value are lower than one, and this value and this value are higher than one, so one must be the median. So the median is also one. And the final measure of central tendency is the mean. So the mean is just the sum of all of the values in the data set divided by the number of values. So in this case, we have minus four, plus one is minus three, plus one is minus two, plus four is two. So the sum of all of the values is two, and we have four values. So the mean is going to be two divided by four, which is a half, right? So the mean value is right here. It's a little bit lower than the median. Again, let's imagine that this is the number line and this is the zero point right here. And we have some values. For example, we have uh, minus four, we have minus two, and we have three over here, 
and we have, let's say, five. Okay, so these are our observations. The first measure of dispersion that we're going to discuss is the range. And the range is the distance between the lowest value and the highest value. So the distance between minus 4 and 5, which is 9. A limitation of the range as a measure of dispersion is that it's completely determined by the value of the lowest case and the value of the highest case. So if this person drops out of the data set, then suddenly our range is 7 instead of 9. Right? So just dropping one person can have a dramatic effect on the range. That's why we also calculate a measure of dispersion that is affected by all of the observations, which is the variance. So to get the variance, we first need to calculate the mean. Remember that the mean is the sum of all of the values, so minus 4 plus minus 2, that's minus 6, plus 3 is minus 3, plus 5 is 2, and we have four observations. So two divided by four, the mean is a half. The mean is one half. So the mean value is approximately here. The second thing that we do is we calculate the distance of each observation to the mean. So for minus two, the distance to the mean, which is a half, is minus two and a half. And for minus four, the distance to the mean is minus four and a half. And for three, the distance to the mean is plus two and a half. And for five, the distance to the mean is plus four and a half. Now we want to take the average of all of these values, but if we do that, we just get zero because half of them are below the mean and half of them are above the mean. So we first need to get rid of the negative values and we do that by squaring all of these values. So we take minus four and a half squared, which is some positive value, and we take minus two and a half squared, which is some positive value, and we take two and a half squared, which is also a positive value, and we take four and a half squared, which is also a positive value. My mental arithmetic is not good enough to calculate this by head, but that's not so important. What's more important is that you realize that we now have a bunch of positive values, all of the squared distances, and we can add those up and divide by the number of observations. And that gives us the average squared distance of points relative to the mean, and that is the variance. And if we write that down, we can say that the variance, S squared, is equal to the sum of all individual observations, x sub i, minus the mean of x, x bar, squared. So these are those squared distances divided by the sample size n. And then often what we do is we apply a little correction here, and we say n minus 1. And that has to do with the fact that we estimated the mean from the sample, so we don't know the true population mean, and instead we substitute the sample mean. And because we estimated this value, we apply a little correction over here. And this is related to degrees of freedom. Finally, the unit of the variance will be whatever units the number line is in squared. Sometimes it can be convenient for interpretation to get rid of the square. So we also define the standard deviation, which is just the square root of the variance. And that's a measure of dispersion in the original units of our variable. I won't get too deep into this last topic today, but I'll just lay the foundation for future lessons and talk a little bit about bivariate distributions. And bivariate distributions describe the co-occurrence of values on two different variables. Again, the type of bivariate descriptions that you can report depend on the measurement level of the variables involved. If you have two nominal variables, report a contingency table. That's like a frequency table where one variable is represented by rows and the other variable is represented by columns. 
So in the cells of the table, you can see how often the combination of values occurred. So here you see a contingency table of self-reported sex and self-reported education level, coded low, medium or high. So we have a nominal variable and an ordinal one. And what you see in the cells are the number of people in our sample that had that combination of values on these two variables. And we also see that within each row, percentages have been calculated. So for example, 40 women reported low education. There are 75 women in total. And if you divide 40 by 75, you get 53.3%. So that's a percentage out of all women. For ordinal and nominal combinations, you can still report a contingency table. But for nominal and interval variable combinations, this quickly becomes unwieldy because interval and ratio variables can take on any possible value. So those tables get very big. So it probably makes more sense in that case to report the mean per group of the nominal variable. If you have two ordinal variables, you could still report a contingency table or you could report a measure of association known as Spearman's correlation coefficient, but this is not part of our course. If you have a combination of ordinal and continuous variables, you could report the point by serial correlation, but again, that's not part of this course. And finally, if you have a combination of two continuous variables, then you can calculate Pearson's correlation coefficient, and that is part of this course, so let's have a closer look at it. We can define the correlation coefficient as a standardized measure of linear association between two variables. That means if one variable goes up, the other also goes up. Or it could mean that if one variable goes up, the other one goes down. When I say that the correlation is a standardized measure, what I mean is it can never be lower than minus one or higher than plus one. In a sample, we use a Roman letter to indicate the correlation coefficient and we use R. And in the population, we use a Greek letter to represent the population parameter for the correlation, which is the rho. A correlation of minus one means perfect negative linear association. So if you go up on one variable, you go down on the other. Zero means no association. If you go up on one variable, anything could happen with the other variable. And a plus one correlation means perfect positive correlation. So if you go up on one variable, you also go up on the other variable. Here are a few scatter plots that visualize patterns in data that could be described by correlation coefficients. So if you start in the top right, there you see an example of a very strong positive correlation. And we know that it's a strong positive correlation because all the dots seem to chase an imaginary diagonal line upwards. So it's going to be a high positive number between 0 and 1. I'm going to guess this is a correlation of 0.8 or 0.9. If we look in the middle on the top row, we also still kind of maybe can imagine that there's a diagonal pattern upwards there. But it's very hard to distinguish from just a random dot cloud. So here I'm going to say maybe there's a positive correlation coefficient, but it's very close to 0, maybe 0.1. In the picture on the top left, there we do see some positive tendency in the data. So this might be a positive correlation of 0.2 or 0.3. Note that I'm just giving you intuitions about these patterns in the data at this point. I'm not telling you how to calculate them yet, but we will get to that in future lectures. Then on the bottom row, on the left, I see a pattern that seems to chase an imaginary line downward. This is a negative correlation, and it's definitely stronger than the one in the middle panel on the top line. So I'm going to say it's maybe negative 0.5. And then in the middle on the bottom line, we see the dots chasing an imaginary hoop in the data. That's not linear. We cannot describe this with a measure of linear association. So even though there is a clear systematic pattern in the data, it's an N-shaped pattern, correlation coefficient is not the correct metric to describe that kind of association. So using just a correlation coefficient, you'll probably get a correlation of zero, even though there is clearly some kind of pattern in the data. And that's all the material we will cover for today. Definitely try to get your hands dirty and compute all of these metrics that you've learned about today on some sample data so you really know what you're doing. Best of luck.